Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you just um, in need of you to speak, to cut through into our hearts. God, as we approach the text today, as we approach your word, God, there could be many things clouding our hearts, clouding our thoughts, distracting our souls. But I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to focus and to enter in into your presence and to hear from you. We need you, Lord. We cannot go a week without hearing from you. Really, we need you every day. As Jesus says, that the man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need your word today. Give me strength and grace to speak to the hearts of your people. Give us all grace to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. We are on the ninth commandment today in our series on the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 16. Exodus 20, verse 16. Um, We'll be on the screen. You can turn there. You can look on your pew Bible. Exodus 20, verse 16 says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is God's word. Imagine a world, a country, a judicial system that allowed for a few untruths. People get up on the stand and testify. Before they testify, do you swear to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But imagine a world where, imagine a situation where we said, you know, you get one lie, just one. Everybody gets one lie, don't tell us what it is. That can be part of your testimony. Imagine the impact on the justice system. That would be just every, just one, not a bunch, just one. I. Uh, I'm sure many of us have been called for jury duty. I was actually selected to be on a jury in a civil suit back in New York City. Um, It was a medical malpractice case. An elderly woman had um, had a surgery, and then subsequently her wound reopened. Not fun. Goes back to the hospital. Which, by the way, if your wound reopens and you've got bowel and stuff coming out, That's not a good situation, right? You've got inside exposed to air, not good, right? So they they re-sew her. Um, Subsequently, she had some some complications coming out of that. But then fast forward several months later, she ends up with an infection in her spine. And so the case was about, was there negligence around how they treated her? Should they have gotten infectious disease on board to, to culture and make sure that they were treating with right antibiotics? Could that have prevented the infection that led to her spine, which led to another surgery and iron rods in her back, or whatever the metal was? In a case like that, you basically have the plaintiff, the defendants, the two doctors, and then a ton of medical experts. But can you imagine if they get on the stand, okay, you get one lie. How messed up as jurors we would be trying to sift through, well, it, was it malpractice or not? And, and thinking about the reputation of these two doctors and the well-being of this woman both being at stake in our decision um, and what would happen. Well, this commandment today, it underscores for us how disruptive falsehood is, and how much we should value the truth. Lies, in fact, pervert justice and are tremendously unloving. Lies pervert justice, they are tremendously unloving. And so the title of today's message is Walk in Truth, Not Falsehood. And there's three points I'd like to talk about around this commandment. Number one, the significance of falsehood. Number two, the pull of falsehood. Number three, the way of truth. So the significance of falsehood, the pull of falsehood, how it can pull on us, tug on us, and the way of truth. As we've been going through the Ten Commandments, we've talked about how they really 
could be distilled down as the New Testament does, loving God and loving our neighbor. The first four, focusing in on loving God. The, the, the final six, focusing in on loving our neighbor. And last week we had Dr. Cuffey. He, he preached about not stealing, don't steal. He, in his approach, he did what you could call, if you wanted to use a fancy term, uh, a synchronic approach. He talked about how the whole concept of stealing in the Near Eastern, uh, ancient Near East, uh, and then its significance relative to the laws like Hammurabi and et cetera. And then in that, showing us really how it reveals God's nature. It's very, you know, and so a lot of my sermons have been on a, a diachronic uh, type of scope where I'm looking at, you know, the, the, t- the text and then going through Scripture. So synchronic, you hear the word synchronize. It's at that time, diachronic through time. Both of them very, you know, legitimate ways for us to learn what God is saying to us. And so this, way, this week, we're looking at the issue of falsehood, not bearing false witness. So point one, the significance of falsehood. Think about this exci- the societal significance of falsehood. I mean, I just propose to you a hypothetical. What if one lie, just one lie, every witness gets one lie? How much havoc that could wreak on the judicial system? It really would crumble the whole system. It would skew all judgments. But one of the things, it's so hard to keep track of everything that's happening in our culture, but one of the things that we have going right now is the whole, you know, January 6th, you know, panel. And just thinking about um, the impact of lies or falsehoods around an election and how destabilizing that can be for a democratic society. Just diminishing even confidence, voter confidence, and how impactful that is. But if we think about the societal impact of lies, the scripture tells us there's an even greater impact. It's the impact that we have before God. And as we dig deeper, we recognize, you know what, that the, the, the falsehood's not all just out there. There's things that we need to wrestle with in our own hearts. The scriptural significance of falsehood being more significant than the societal impact, if you look at the whole concept of the, what does it say? The text says in in our ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness. Right away we see there is a context here. It's talking about the courtroom, right? You notice how, I mean, we already interpret it as don't lie, but it It's not really saying that specifically or just in that narrow definition of lying. It's talking about a courtroom. And why is it talking about that? Well, in the ancient, um, you know, Jewish culture, first of all, Israel was a a theocracy. They were serving God. God was their ultimate king. And so their laws weren't just civil in orientation. They were also oriented towards walking rightly with God. And for many of their laws... There was capital punishment. There were, capital, there were many capital offenses. Striking your parents, capital offense. Um, cheating on your spouse could be a capital offense, as well as killing someone. They didn't have DNA. They didn't have fingerprinting. There's no blood samples. There's no su- surveillance cameras, no CCTV, no emails to review. So how do you know if something did or didn't happen, eyewitnesses, right? So you think about the power of witnesses in a, in, a, in a society like that, it becomes elevated. This is the only way we can know if something did or didn't happen is we, did you see it? And then it was, a, it was in Scripture that there has to be at least two witnesses to verify. So it's, this is why it's so remarkable if you're familiar with Solomon, King Solomon, his ruling, when there are two women who come to him and they claim that, both of them claim that the child living is theirs, and both say that the other child died, and he's able to discern which one is actually the real mother without any witnesses. The text goes out of its way to say there, are no, there was no one else present in the tent except these two women and their newborn babies. And Solomon figures out who the real mom is. That's why it's so remarkable. There were no witnesses. So bearing a false witness 
jeopardizes someone's livelihood, someone's life in a system like that. It perverts justice. It's unloving. Uh, and so you see that there is a, a, a falsehood is, is extremely significant in the uh, going in the court setting where you're trying to adjudicate someone's guilt or innocence becomes the most extreme manner by which you could break the ninth commandment. Not the only manner, the most extreme manner, the most, the most is at stake, you know, if someone is being charged for murder or saying that they've cheated or whatever the case is. But if you expand the scope of what is the ninth commandment meaning, what is its, its significance, how should we view it for ourselves? If you look at Leviticus 19, 15, and 16, it begins to help us. Uh, Leviticus 19, I believe it's going to be on the screen. Leviticus 19, 15, you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. But it also says, you shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. So you see right away the ninth commandment is expanded beyond the courtroom. It's also talking about going around and saying lies about other people. I mean, we live in a, a, our society, we're like really good at that nowadays. I mean, just that's pretty much not exclusively, but what social media is used for. It's you take what one person says and then you, you, you react to it and you blast them and you call them names and, and, it, and then it just goes back and forth. I mean, at least... That's what it, when I, when I read through it, I'm like, wow, this is just really intense. One person says this, then the next person takes it out of context or says, oh, you're really like this, or, and then it just snowballs. But the scripture says, don't go around being a slanderer. Why? Because I'm the Lord. God himself, he embodies truth. He is truth. He calls his people not to give in to falsehood. So if we dig into, okay, the commandment itself is beyond, it is focusing in on the courtroom, but it's expanded beyond the courtroom. It goes into at least slandering. We'll get to some other things in a moment here. But what does scripture mean by falsehood? Because, you know, we can have different definitions of, well, what is false? Is it a narrow thing or is it a wide thing? Well, what's interesting is, by the way, the Ten, the ten Commandments are given to us twice in scripture, once in Exodus once in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, the second law, the second generation. Uh, after the 40 years in the, il- in, the, in the wilderness, the second generation is present. Moses is reviewing the law. He gives it again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And what you notice is it actually uses two different words for falsehood between Exodus and Deuteronomy. In the one case, it's talking more about deception. In the other case, it's defining things that are worthless. They're worthless towards attaining the truth. In the one case, the falseness is it's something that causes a mistaken belief. It's like the social media post, you know, a couple years ago that said, well, COVID is spread by 5G towers. Did you ever hear about that one? And so people were literally going around. I know in Great Britain this was happening. Tearing down 5G towers thinking, oh, we're getting rid of the pandemic. It seems laughable, but it's very real. They thought hey, this is how, why? Because something that leads to a mistaken belief was proliferated. That's a, the that's a type of falsehood. Another type of falsehood or the other type of falsehood is around something that is worthless towards attaining the truth. It's the same word that is used in the commandment to not take God's word in vain. The thought of worshiping vain idols. The thought of this is actually, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a false sense of security in something, but it's actually not going to do anything to help me. Or it's giving someone else a false hope in something that really is not going to help them. And so as you, as you start to dig in, the whole concept of falsehood, is a, it's, a broad, it's a broad definition. Falsehood happens in many pa- aspects of society. Falsehoods are of many varieties. So let's talk about that's the significance of falsehood. Let's talk about point number two, the pull of falsehood. 
Because if you think about it, in this one commandment, there's two realities that are actually given to us, they're presented to us. One is, it's admitting we all have an ability to be fooled, to be tricked, to be mis misled, right? Because if nobody could be misled, there's no point in giving a commandment, don't lie effectively. The other thing that it is giving to us or is assuming about us is that we actually are kind of like the car that pulls to the one direction, or if you've gone in the grocery store and you get the, the that, I, it, I always, I seem to get that one cart that I'm fighting with the whole time because it keeps going this way. And so scripture is, is showing us that we're like that cart because we actually have this natural curve towards falsehood. I'll show you what I mean. But first, let's just consider the two, the, the reality what is this whole, where does, the, where does the ability to be fooled come from? Where, where does that source? Well, that actually is not exclusively, but certainly is tied to the limited nature of us being created beings. We're not all-knowing. We're not ever-present. We don't see everything. Our faculties can deceive us. Our eyes can deceive us. You ever, you see somebody oh, sorry, I thought you were somebody else, right? Our ears can deceive us. We thought we heard something. Hey, what was that? Oh, no, no, that was nothing. Our, our tastes can deceive us. I had, we had some popcorn the other night on date night. What is that flavor? And then find out, what was it, rosemary? It's like, oh, not what I was expecting. We, we, there's some, our, all of our fact, faculties can let us down. You, you could tell me... Um, I'm doing a wedding coming up, well, not only this week, but in August, um, and uh, Hannah Lee over there, she was telling me, yeah, this is the Chinese character for happiness. She could be pulling my leg. I don't know Chinese characters. I mean, we all have a capacity to be fooled. We, we can be fooled. We are limited, finite beings. Some of us know, are good at some things, better at other things. Some of us could, yeah, I, can, I, got, I got relativity, but I can't cook you know, or, you know, whatever the case is. And so there is a, rooted in our limited nature of being created beings, we can all be fooled. And therefore, God has given us a provision. He's saying, don't give in to falsehood. Walk in truth. But let's talk about the other part of that, the fact that we actually have this inclination towards falsehood. Where does that come from? Well, that comes from the fall itself. I mean, you think about it, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, that's going to pop up on the screen. Adam and Eve, before they give in to the enticement of the serpent, they are in perfect trust before each other and before the Lord, in perfect honesty before each other and before the Lord. But then Genesis, but, but then the serpent comes and he plants the seed of the idea. God's not as loving as you think he is. He's not as really about your best interests. And so therefore, what he told you not to do, you should actually do that. And the result is, this is that they heard the sound of the Lord walking. After they took of the fruit they were not supposed to, supposed to eat of, they heard the sound of the Lord walk, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What are they doing? They're hiding. So you think about it. Transparency is, you know what, I don't want to hide anything from you. I want to let you know, you can ask me any question, I will tell you anything. They're not transparent anymore. That perfect trust, that perfect honesty has now been tainted. And now, I actually, I'm not going to tell you everything. We're going, we're that, we became that cart pulling to the left, to, to whatever side. And so for all of us, we are born with this nature of, I'm not going to trust. I'm, my, my, I'm pulling towards not trusting you. And I'm not trusting God. And, I, and, and therefore, I, I can't be honest because I don't trust you. In fact, I have to protect myself, so I'm not, I, may, I, may even, I may even present falsehoods to you out of self-preservation. 
it, it's the part of you that says, if someone says, hey, don't lie, and you say, well, I would never do that. Well, wait a minute. Isn't, we've all lied. So there's this, I don't even want to admit that I, I actually have told lies. It's a part of you that, well, you break your toe and you're like, I, that's not broken. It's just, it's just, you know, it'll get better. It's, it's that proclivity to, be, we, we don't want to believe what is actually true. We, you know what, there's another explanation here. You pass someone in the hall, they don't greet you, and you immediately assume, oh, he's stuck up. She's self-absorbed. Maybe they didn't see you. Maybe they had something on their mind. Maybe they were preoccupied. It's the court of public opinion. Something flashes on the news, it pops up on our phone, and then everybody just goes off. But wait a minute, did you get all the facts? Do you actually know what happened before you've come to a conclusion? It's our societal proclivity to say, well, so-and-so was accused of something, and therefore they are guilty, right? Because that's how it works. Guilty until proven innocent, or just guilty because the news said you were accused, and therefore you are guilty. All of that is a pull towards falsehood and not a, hey, you know what? I want to know the real facts of the story. It's when someone comes to you and they confide and they say, hey, so-and-so did this, and then you judge that person for what they did, but you didn't hear the other side of the story. And I could go on and on. The reality is all of us, we are all pulled towards falsehood. And unknowingly, it happens actually quite frequently. I mean, we live in this digital age. You know, you get a text from somebody, you get an email from somebody. How dare they? You know, but wait a minute. What was their intention? You know, what were they actually saying? We jump to the conclusion on the negative. We jump to a conclusion which is falsehood about the person. You see, because falsehood or lying or giving false witness, it's lying about someone. It's lying to someone. Or it's believing lies about them. That could be about God, it could be about our neighbor, it could be about ourselves lying to someone, lying about someone in their absence, believing of lives about someone. It's the pull in all of our hearts. It's, it's, it, 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 there's so many ways that it can manifest. It's slandering, it's oversharing. I, re, I remember being in this office as a, in a temp uh, role as a college student. I was probably 21. I was doing this temp job at Duke um, Hospital, um, working in the, you know, pushing paper type thing. And uh, I think there's probably 20, it was me and then like 20 women who worked in this particular office, um, which is an interesting dynamic. And so, um, you know, they're mostly great. And, uh, but but there, I would overhear occasionally, so Sally. How was your weekend? Oh, my weekend was great. You know, so-and-so came over, and it was this couple, and they brought their baby. But, you know, but, you know, but actually, okay, but that's not actually his baby. Let me tell you about that. I'm like, okay, how long, what, what time do we get out of here? It's oversharing. You know, it's, hey, I'm offering details about this person that are unsavory that you actually don't really need to know. Those are all ways that we can give in to falsehood. All of these things, they point back to our flesh, our fleshly nature. And if you think about it, falsehood often either can be done out of malice or of pride. Malice, I want to harm this person. Pride, I want to preserve my image before you, and therefore I'm misrepresenting things, presenting myself in a way that's not true. But in doing all of that, we image more of the way of Satan, who is called the father of lies by our Lord Jesus Christ, rather than the image of God, who never lies. So what is the way of truth? Last point. Christianity really is an encounter of truth, an encounter with truth. 
And some might say, well, that's overplayed. You know, I've heard that before. We've said that before. Look at all the mess that's going on in the church and all the hypocrisy. And you've got what's happened with the SBC and you've got different things going on. It's like, well, how can you say it's an encounter with truth? Well, what's interesting, truth is not just um, an inanimate object or just sort of concept. It's a person. Jesus said, I am the truth. And in fact, you know, for those who would push back and say, well, Christianity has been called the truth, but look at all this craziness that's happening and all the things. You know, when Jesus came on the scene, he actually called out religious hypocrisy. hypocrisy. The things that we're seeing happening in the church, he actually said, that's, that's wrong, right? So for us to critique what's happening in the church, we'd actually be upholding what Jesus is saying, not diminishing it. We'd actually be honoring what the true nature of Christianity is, not, not somehow tarnishing it. It is an encounter with truth. The truth is a person. It's truth with a capital T. And there's so many things that we could say about encountering the truth, but here's what Jesus says to his father in his high priestly prayer in John 17. He says this. should show up on the screen. You think about the night that Jesus has been betrayed and, or he's about to be betrayed. It's in his last 24 hours before he goes on the cross. And he's praying to the Father and he says, and he's prayed for you and he says, Father, sanctify them, talking about those who believe. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. He goes on to say, for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. So, the, so what Jesus is saying is, he, re, he recognizes we have a pull towards falsehood. And he's saying, Father, sanctify them in your word. See, our hope, the, this message, by the way, this is not about, hey, Upgrade your Christianity. Stop telling lies, you know, or maybe tell, don't tell as many lies. This is about recognizing that we, we live, we are actually entangled in a world of falsehood. Falsehoods about God, falsehoods about life, falsehoods about, and you could click on any news channel, you could look on any social media feed and further reinforce that reality. And it, therefore, it really exposes to us our deep need for the way of truth, the person of Jesus, who sanctifies his people through the word of God. It's the image of John Newton. John Newton, who was a part of the North, Aman North Atlantic slave trade. He was a trader and, and owner, I believe. Um, he had been exposed to Christianity at a young age. But then he finally, he, he finally meets the truth. He finally meets Jesus, and, and the Lord turns his heart, and he realizes how wretched he was. And then he pins that famous song that we, we all know. There's even a Broadway musical about it for a period of time. Amazing grace, amazing grace, you know, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He, he encountered the truth. The truth sanctified him. He believed lies about people of African descent. But when the truth came, it changed his heart. It's like the Plato um, in the Republic and that whole allegory of the cave. And there's people, they've, they've been uh, shackled. They face the wall. There's a fire behind them. And there's light that comes from outside the cave. And whenever someone passes by the cave, they see the shadow on the wall. So they know that there's people. But one of them gets free, and he goes out. And at first, he encounters the light, and he, he rejects everything that he sees because he cannot compute. He cannot reconcile the images that they saw in the cave with the reality of things as they actually are. Until he fully comes to terms with, this is, the, this is actual life, what we were living in wasn't actually real. It was a shadow. That's what Jesus does. It's the, it's, he comes into all of our falsehood, and he 
And the word of God begins to penetrate our hearts and begins to turn things that are dark to light. He begins to shift our, our views on fill-in-the-blank category. Fill-in-the-blank cultural narrative that's happening in today's news. Jesus begins to turn our eyes so that we are able to see. And we may have that same reaction. This cannot be right. This can't be right until we finally embrace what he says. The word of God sanctifies us. It makes us able to go from falsehood into truth. The Apostle Paul says it this way, our last scripture, Colossians 3, 9. Speaking to the church in Colossae. It says, do not lie to one another. Why? Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices... And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. What is Paul saying? Do you see what he's saying? He's saying the reason why you shouldn't lie, the reason why you shouldn't walk in falsehood is because as a believer, you've put off the old way. The, the old way, the flesh, the way of Adam, the way of the world, you've put that off. That's not you anymore. You have a new identity. You've put on Christ. And in Christ, there is no falsehood. He's the truth. And so, therefore, you, you, you shouldn't lie to one another. You should walk in truth. You should honor the truth. You should gravitate towards truth. And you should live in a way where, you're, where you see falsehood in your own heart and you're, you push that out because the word of God comes in to be an image bearer of our Lord. So what does this all mean here quickly? You might say, yeah, I recognize the impact of lies in relationships. Certainly none of us would want people going around our workplace telling lies about us. We all recognize the, 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 the painful impact of lies in, in a marriage, in a, a parent-child relationship at work or whatever, or society at large, and how destabilizing, mistrust generating those all are. But do you recognize your own pool your own pull towards falsehood, how it can pull at your heart, given the right circumstances, how you could misrepresent things or believe lies about someone or present things falsely to someone, or even just in the absence of, hey, I'm in, I, I have something against this person, but I'm pretending like I don't, right? It's the tendency to exaggerate. It's the tendency to find always the negative aspect in a person's character. There is an internal struggle in all of us, if we're honest, towards falsehood. But thankfully, we don't have to stay there. Do you see the beauty of Jesus in his truth and what he offers you and how he comes to sanctify you and cleanse you? He doesn't say, you just need to, you just need to try better. You just need to do better. He says, no, let me cleanse your heart. Receive my word. Let it transform you. Begin to love the things that I love and to hate the things that I hate. Reject those. Jesus so is compassionate towards all of us that he has prayed to the Father on your behalf that you would be a lover of truth and one who grows in the truth. And he calls you now into a new image to walk in his ways. Let's pray. Father, one of the most unloving things and unjust or unjust things that we can do is to walk in falsehood, proliferate, proliferate falsehoods, and reject the truth. God, we want to be those who honor our neighbor and ultimately who reflect your image. May you show us, even in the depths of our own hearts, where we could go astray into falsehood and may we cling to your truth that we bear your image in the earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.